well. May I pray as we transition to the message today. Lord, we continue to dedicate this time to you. We continue to seek your voice, your spirit. Lord, bless this time that we have. We have prayed, we have given, we have sang, we have listened, and we just want to continue to worship you by opening our hearts to you. We ask in Jesus' name, amen. I, uh, I always look forward to sharing a message, and I'm going to begin today as I normally do. Now, Toby's not here, so I need to recruit some help with uh, the mics. I got black and yellow here, guys. So, Mitch and Jeff, thank you so much. I begin my messages with a little interactive time uh, with the young people. I call it the kids' quiz. I'm going to be talking about Jesus and his father, Joseph, as Eva mentioned, the gift of the Father. So I want to jump right into the kids quiz today. Just raise your hand. This allows it to be heard um, on our recording, allows everyone to hear it in the sanctuary as well. So, um, and you know, Ezekiel, I'm pointing at you because there's not a lot of young people, so you can jump in here. Who's the most famous Old Testament carpenter? Who do you think would fit the category of being an Old Testament carpenter that did great things? Julian? Jesus' dad. Yeah, that he was a carpenter, wasn't he? We want to go a little bit further back in time, though, if you can think about Old Testament. Um, yeah, Leah. Noah. Hey, I think Noah would fit that category. What do you guys think? I think Noah is probably the most uh, uh, profound carpenter. Now, ship's carpentry is probably slightly different than what we would think, but uh, an amazing feat of woodworking to build that vessel. I, I don't think there's any doubt about that. So very interesting. Next one, what other fantastic structures did God's people build in the Old Testament? A couple of hints. One they built in the desert, one they built in Jerusalem. Kind of similar buildings too. Julian, you sure about this? You ready to go? All right, let's hear it. The golden calf. <laughs> the golden calf. <laughs> The golden calf, that is an amazing thing. I'm sure it was an amazing creation, that, that golden calf. Uh, we need to talk, Pastor Jean, figure this out. By the way, I do want to apologize a, a little bit in advance. If any of your kids were traumatized by Dean Mark's children's story, you just let me know about eating the reindeer. And I don't even know how many of these kids know what a Sears catalog is. I mean, I'm just... I just so if we need to work on that, I do apply. Okay, but uh, other structures, a couple of young men over here, and then uh, Ryan back there. All right, Sean, I see you. Yes. The temple. They built the temple. Let's, um, can we give uh, Ryan a chance back here? And uh, yeah, I see you, Owen. Don't worry. Thank you, Mitch. What else did they build, Ryan? The Sphinx. Well, very interesting. I, you know, there's ideas about what they may have built while they're in Egypt. Uh, probably not the Sphinx, but that is a very impressive thing that was built um, that's still there, but good idea. All right, Owen? The Tower of Babel. Okay, well, the Tower of Babel was something that people built in rebellion to God. <laughs> you guys are thinking about things built. I like that. A, B. The Tabernacle. The Tabernacle. Yes, that, those are the two I was trying to uh, tease out, okay? Uh, yeah, well, he said the temple. So they, they, again, they're similar structures. They're, they, they kind of perform the same function. The glorious tabernacle built from the riches of Egypt, uh, and the, you know, as they, they plundered Egypt and they built this fantastic structure in the desert. And then they uh, also eventually Solomon's temple gets built. It's destroyed and then rebuilt um, and then becomes Herod's temple later on. And again, I just think it's interesting when you think about uh, the, the different Old Testament stories of things built representing God's plan of salvation. The ark was a device of salvation. That's what it was designed for. The sanctuary and the temple were things uh, built to bring salvation to all people. So it kind of makes sense that Jesus would be raised by a carpenter um, because he would also build a structure designed for salvation. He would 
design and build the church as an organic structure, not a physical structure like we would think. But I would also say, even as I was typing this out, if, if, if I didn't know that Joseph was a carpenter, um, I would have presumed that Jesus would have been raised by a shepherd, wouldn't you? I mean, you think of all the heroes of the Old Testament. They're like all shepherds. Moses was a shepherd. David was a shepherd. Abraham, Isaac, the whole family. Every, even Abel in the garden. They're all shepherds. And I would have assumed that clearly teaches that the institution of being a shepherd is what's needed to be a great leader. And, uh, but, but Joseph being a carpenter, obviously the, the idea of construction and building um, is also to be valued. Now, um, no matter what Joseph's profession was, there's a, there's a nobility about every profession, right? If Joseph had been a farmer or a fisherman, we'd be able to say there's great qualities about that. If, if Joseph had been a merchant or a blacksmith, you know, we'd be able to say there were values that he could have passed on. If Joseph had been a tax collector, we would have said, hallelujah. No, we probably wouldn't have said that. Um, there are, you got to have a boundary and limits. But <laughs> Jesus would be raised, uh, interestingly enough, uh, by a carpenter. Number three. Now, in the story, as we get more into the life of Jesus, it's very interesting, Joseph, uh, how God speaks with Joseph. So I just want to check your memories here, young people. How many times did God speak to Joseph in a dream? All right, I see Eric and I see Abel. You guys are ready to go back here. <laughs> go ahead, Abel. One. He says one. What do you say, Eric? Three. Okay, three. By the way, never hand a young person a mic. <laughs> never. You never know what's going to happen. No, I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. All right, I see uh, Andre and Julian. So let's have Julian do next. I've heard one. I've heard three. Two. Okay, we've covered one and two and three. What do you think, Andre? I just say four. Wow. Wow. That is a key Bible student right there. You guys, it actually is four times. There are four separate times in the book of Matthew that it says Joseph was spoken to in a dream. The first one, uh, uh, the baby is, uh, Joseph is, you know, obviously concerned his wife is pregnant and he has a dream and he is told the baby's from the Holy Spirit. Then he's told to flee to Egypt because Herod's going to go come after him. Then after Herod dies, the Bible says in, in the book of Matthew that he had another dream saying, hey, it's safe to go back to Israel, but he was afraid to, he didn't know where to go. So he had a fourth dream where God basically said, don't go anywhere near the um, son of Herod. And that's why Joseph ends up going up to Galilee. So there's actually four times, every time in a dream too, by the way, which is an interesting parallel. I'm not going to get in it today, but Joseph's name. Who's the other famous Joseph in the Bible? The, yeah, Joseph, the one who interprets dreams from the Old Testament, who uh, has this ability to interpret dreams. And here Joseph in the New Testament also is able to understand the will of God through a dream. And there's wonderful uh, analogies and things that can be learned from that as well. Okay, last question for the young people. When is the last time we read of Joseph, not just a reference to him, but he's actually present, he's alive? When is the last time we read of Joseph? Is it in Nazareth after the return from Egypt? Is it in Jerusalem when Jesus was 12? Was he there at the Jordan River when Jesus was baptized? Or do we see a peak of him at the feeding of the 5,000? Where, where's the last time we read about Joseph? Okay, young men, I see Abel and Eric are just raring to go. Let's give Eric the first one here. <laughs> B. B. Okay, in Jerusalem, Jesus 12. Abel, did you want to say something different? C. All right, you're saying the Jordan River. Okay, I'll give, let's have Anna. Anna's not had a chance yet. Anna? B. Also a B. And then we're going to give Eric the last one because he hasn't had a chance yet. C. Okay, so we've had some disagreement between uh, some of the young people. As far as, as, as it's clear in the Bible, it was when Jesus was 12. I didn't mean to be tricky on that. Thank you, gentlemen, for your technical assistance uh, with the kids' quiz. So the last time we read about Joseph physically present with Mary and with Jesus is in that little story in the Gospel of Luke when Jesus comes to the temple at the age of 12, which is a, a likely inference that Joseph probably dies before his baptism. 
Again, there's no chapter and verse where we can turn to where uh, it explicitly says, but Joseph is nowhere in the story at all uh, in the life of Christ from the time of his baptism. In Desire of Ages, for those of you who are uh, appreciate the writings of Ellen White. Her chapter after the Jerusalem experience is called Days of Conflict. She also never mentions Joseph. So it's likely and it's pretty much traditionally understood that Joseph probably died in Jesus's teen years. Uh, again, we wouldn't you know, know maybe he, you know, up until he was older in his early 20s, mid 20s. Uh, but the, the tradition and the assumption is that after that experience at the age of 12, probably not within too many years after that, Joseph may have actually died. And he's clearly not alive uh, during the time of the ministry of Christ. And again, you look at Jesus giving Mary, his mother, to the caretaking of John. Clearly, if, if Joseph had been part of the picture at that time, that would have been a very strange arrangement and we wouldn't anticipate that. So it's just interesting to note that Jesus knows what it's also like to lose a father at a young age. He lost his earthly father before the age of 30, maybe even and likely even as a teenager, Joseph departs the picture of the story and the family of Jesus. I like to get into some of the sides and stories of the, uh, of the Christmas story or of the family of Jesus that we don't always look at. Last week, I touched on some of the growing up experiences of Christ with his siblings. If you remember, he had at least six siblings the Bible explicitly talks about four brothers, names them, and it mentions sisters, plural. So there had to have been at least two. So he's not just, again, when you picture the nativity, you often see Mary and Joseph and the baby, and you don't really anticipate or understand that he's part of a much larger family, which was anticipated and expected within that culture and community that there would have been more children. So who is Joseph? Now, for the purposes of my message today, you can read lots of anecdotal and historical structures that have been created in theory about who Joseph is. And there's all kinds, especially in the Catholic tradition of, of uh, you know, things that he did and who he was. And that's fine to evaluate. I'm going to stick to basically what the Bible reveals and what we can stick somewhat confidently in. We don't know much biblically as significant of a role as we would assume Joseph played in the life of Christ. It's interesting that we don't know much, but what we do know is pretty significant, not just his profession and where he lived and, and some of the things I mentioned last week, but the characteristics of Joseph are identifiable in the scripture. We know he's devout. He is following uh, the, the plan of God. He pays the, uh, the price uh, of the newborn when they dedicate Jesus. He is uh, attending the Passover as a faithful Jew would do when Jesus was at the age of 12. He's familiar with the scriptures. So he's devout, he's faithful. There's a humility about the story of Joseph when you consider it. The Bible says outright in Matthew that he was a righteous man. He, he had good values. He, he, he was compassionate towards the situation with Mary when he found out that she was pregnant. He could have done things differently, but he was trying to find the most compassionate thing to do in that circumstance before the angel spoke to him in a dream. We know he was poor. Uh, we know that he's obedient. Now, I want to think about him responding to the dreams. Now, I've had some wild dreams before. I'm sure some of you have had some dreams before. I doubt it was the first time that God had communicated with Joseph in a dream when he revealed to Joseph that Mary's pregnancy was a result of the Holy Spirit. I just, I just have to believe that that probably wasn't the first time that Joseph had had an intimate conversation or revelation from God because, again, if that had been the first time, he might have just woke up and said, wow, I really ate some kind of wild turnip last night or, you know, I just had this weird sensation that God told me this crazy idea that, that Mary is pregnant uh, through this miracle of the Holy Spirit. He had some intimacy with God because a natural, normal person who did not have that would not anticipate that a dream would, would give you that kind of information. And it's interesting to identify that this is not how God communicated with Mary. It was not through a dream. I'm going to talk about Mary next week, by the way. And I've done this for a reason of, of starting kind of generically with the family of Jesus last week, looking at Joseph today, and then getting to the person of Mary next week. Um, so we're going to look more at Mary next week, but God communicates more directly with Mary. Mary is not in a dream or even really in a vision state 
when Gabriel comes to talk to her. It reveals that an angel just appeared to her, gives her the information, and she says, uh, the bond servant of the Lord, may it be unto me as you have said. Um, but when it comes to Joseph, the Lord communicates with him through a dream. And for Joseph to know the voice of the Lord, to wake up from that dream and say, now I know that this child is the Messiah. This child is from the Holy Spirit. You, you, you understand that he had to have had a walk with the Lord. Does that make sense? Because if he was a fringe kind of understanding of God's plan or did not have an intimacy with the Lord, these aren't natural things. Even the flight to Egypt, when God tells him in a dream, uh, Herod is out to get this kid, you got to get to Egypt. The Bible says he got up that very night and responded immediately. He knew the voice of God. He knew the voice of God to, to the point that he would trust what God had said to him, said to him and he would obey he would obey the voice of God. This is the type of man that he was. Very courageous. I think you, you have to acknowledge a, 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 that he was a valiant individual, courageous, and that he would continue to embrace this disrespectful circumstance, that he would uh, take the, the uh, honor uh, from God, but realizing the dishonor that that would bring. Remember, it's his name that would be impacted by marrying Mary. It is the name of Joseph and his family. The other brothers would be impacted by Joseph's decision by, in the eyes of the community, bringing an impure woman into his marriage, right? So there was a valiancy. There was a, a courage of Joseph to say, I'm going to do the right thing that God has spoken to me. I'm going to take this, this woman into my uh, into my uh, into my marriage and family, knowing that this is the work of God, despite what appearances may look like. So again, very little, you know, uh, significant description and information, but just by what little we know, we can see some wonderful qualities in the man called Joseph. Now, there are some things that uh, the Bible doesn't outright say, uh, but we can kind of infer. And like I said last week, he was probably older. And in, in the fact that he probably already had those six children, maybe more, when he marries Mary. Um, and by the way, like I said last week, this was the Christian understanding for a thousand years or more up until recently when different ideas uh, came into the, the, the idea of who Mary and Joseph were. Again, as I mentioned earlier, he probably dies. We know he's probably gone before the baptism, maybe even much earlier but I think we can also infer and believe and have confidence in that he loved Jesus. I don't think there's any doubt of that. I don't think there's any question about the character of Joseph being the type that was needed for the infant Christ, the adolescent Christ, the, even up into the time of his death, that Joseph was a man that God entrusted, just as he entrusted, it, he entrusted the Messiah to Mary, he entrusted him to Joseph as well. And I love the song, guys. Thank you so much for choosing that. Um, Joseph does not feature as prominently in the historical development of the nativity or in popular culture, customs, and carols. And there's two, two things uh, related to this that are very interesting to me. I'm always kind of a, a root for the underdog type person and just wondering where you know, why people get left out. When you think of outside of the uh, central nativity of, you know, the stable and, and uh, the animals and the wise men and all that, Joseph is clearly there. Outside of that, though, Joseph very rapidly disappears from the story of Christ or within the, 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 the Christian uh, 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 embracement of the role of Joseph in the life of Christ. And I just want you to think of this for a second. Can you think of not the Mercy Me song that we just heard. Can you think of a single Christmas carol that highlights or honors Joseph? Can you think of a single one? So we sing about the angels. We celebrate the wise men. We applaud those shepherds. We venerate the manger. And we marvel at Mary, the mother of Jesus. And nothing wrong with any of that. I had the, all of those are wonderful things, but can you? But Joseph is nowhere to be found in most of the traditional uh, 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 celebrations. Uh, again, aside from the the hooded guy looking over the manger in the in the in the in the central nativity, 
he really disappears. As a matter of fact, now there are, I, I, I looked it up, there are a few songs and hymns, some of them recently been made, you know, Tim McGraw, uh, you can always leave it to country music to find the, the down and out stories and celebrate them. So Tim McGraw sings a song about uh, Joseph, and there's some modern songs that have come out. But within the classical structure of, of the church, the hymns, the Christmas carols, do you know you have to go all the way back to the 4th century, the, four, like th- the 300s, to find a significant hymn or carol written about Joseph? This is uh, St. Ephraim Cyrus, who wrote the song, St. Joseph Meek and Mild. Now, it's got three traditional stanzas. I just These are the words of how the, the, the hymn opens. It would be a thousand years before this would be put to music, by the way. A thousand years before this hymn of Joseph would be put to music. It was just prose before that, just something you spoke. St. Joseph, meek and mild, embraced the newborn child, then knelt upon the sod, the old man. Notice that? Again, for over a thousand years, Joseph was always understood to be elder, or an older man with a, having had a family and marrying a younger wife as, as part of uh, helping raise the family if his wife had previously died. But here, fourth century, St. Ephraim, the old man, well aware that deity lay there, adored the child as God. It's actually a beautiful hymn. Let's all sing it together. The St. Joseph meek mild. I don't know how it goes. You can YouTube it. And I just, I think that's sad. I think Joseph played a bigger role in Jesus' life than we have allowed him in our stories and songs to play. I, I, think, I think fathers are pretty, pretty important. I'm going to preach over here for a while. <laughs> fathers... Uh, and, you know, I, I, sometimes and maybe at another time, we can go into the whole uh, idea of how fatherhood in general is a declining value within our society. Um, and, and there are lots of things that we can see for that. But I just wonder how that might play into the story of Joseph uh, and how the father element is not always as prominent. Um, the other element that I want to just illustrate from this is historically over time, one of the reasons why Joseph gets pushed out of the picture is because Mary gets so highly elevated within the religious structure of Christianity. Um, and this can be illustrated a hundred ways, a thousand ways in, in different forms of art and poetry and literature. Just two quick images just to illustrate this. This is um, uh, an artist by the name of Botticelli, um, uh, an Italian uh, in, in the 15th century, who does this image. It's called the Madonna in the Mag- of the Magnificat. Um, Madonna just means my lady. It's another term for Mary. Um, this is during the height of the Renaissance. Um, and Mary is depicted with the infant Christ. Very common picture of, of Mary and the infant Christ. You're not uh, surprised that, by that at all. But just, just when you know how the picture develops, Mary obviously is the central figure. She's gloriously adorned, notice. She is not the poor pauper uh, that, that, you know, historically and biblically uh, she would have been. So she's gloriously adorned because she represents the church too, by the way, uh, Mary, uh, the mother. You have the infant Christ. She's writing the Magnificat. That's the little uh, hymn of praise that she speaks in, in the Gospel of Luke um, uh, when she says, my soul exalts the Lord and, uh, and uh, his name is great. And um, that's the Magnificat. She's writing the Magnificat. And there you see the hand of Christ. Do you see it uh, resting on her hand there? Okay, kind of signifying that the, 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 the infant Savior is kind of directing or inspiring or assisting in that scriptural writing. Um, you have uh, Mary here focusing here. The other five uh, little girls are angels. That's what they are. They're angels that are attending to Mary and the, the infant, and uh, they're focused on Mary. And what do you see going on up here? Who's getting crowned? Mary is getting crowned. And you can see the sun above that there. She's getting crowned with the power of the sun. She's getting crowned with the brightness and the glory of the sun. The whole focus is on Mary. Jesus is there, 
But it's not Jesus who's being crowned. It's not Jesus who's being glorified. It's Mary. And again, I don't want to be derogatory towards Mary. I'm going to talk about Mary next week. You may hear some things you've never heard before. And you, uh, I, I hope you will come to appreciate because we do need to appreciate Mary. But is she the focus of the story at Christmas time? She is not. Uh, she's a major part of it, a significant part, um, but she is not the one being crowned, friends. This is part of what the story develops over time that people kind of leave out Joseph. He's not even in the picture at all. He is gone and it's Mary's focus. One other one, uh, and again, not to de be derogatory towards these wonderful pieces of art. This is the Piatta. I've seen this myself. It's in Rome. Uh, it's massive. It's one of the great um, sculptures by Michelangelo uh, Bonarotti. Um, it's massive too. Um, it's huge. It's behind bulletproof glass uh, because it has been vandalized uh, over time and, and things like that. It is an absolute genius creation from the mind of, of, uh, of, of Michelangelo, uh, highly respected, well uh, 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 shown and appreciated. It's called the Piazza, the pity or the compassion. It depicts Mary now holding Jesus after the crucifixion, okay? Now, when you look, again, this is 15th century, same time period of Botticelli, um, 15th century. Do you notice anything kind of odd, though, about this sculpture? Okay. How old was Jesus when he died on the cross? He was a man, right? He's in his 30s, 33 or so, right? How old would Mary have been around that time? Even if she'd been a teenager when she had Jesus, late 40s, early 50s-ish, okay? What's, do you notice a, a kind of a contrast in the proportions of this? How, how large of a, of a person does that look like? That'd be like me putting Toby on Gina's lap, right? He looks like he's about 13 or 14 years old. And Michelangelo did this on purpose. It was not a mistake of proportions. It was not an accident. Oh, I just ran out of marble. I didn't anticipate what to do here, so let's make Jesus a little smaller. This was a, an intentional thing. About 80% of the marble here is Mary. 80% of the rock is Mary, and only 20% is... It. By the way, this is from a solid stone. I it just I can't believe in, in one in, someone in one lifetime would do this, and David did, or Michelangelo did others, including the David and the Moses and, and uh, the Sistine Chapel, whatever. Um, but Mary is about twice as large as what the natural proportions would have been. And again, it is intentionally done this way by the era of the church and of the era of the artist, because Mary had become the central focus, not just of the Christmas story, but of the Christian story altogether, to the point that Joseph does get pushed out, and at times, even Jesus is shrunk in proportions. So again, I'm not here just to kick, uh, pick on Catholics or anything like that. Uh, uh, you're free to value or appreciate or believe uh, things differently than, than what we, we talk about here. But Joseph gets forgotten. That's my point. Joseph gets forgotten. He gets forgotten historically. He gets forgotten in our pageantry. And um, I want to restore him a little bit. Does he play a significant part in Jesus' life at all? Well, let me ask you, does any father play a significant uh, role in a child's life? For better or for worse, there's no getting around it. There's no neutrality. There's no, there's no, uh, you know, uh, one way or it. Either they do or they don't for good or for bad. But yes, every father plays a significant role. And God had a plan for who would be the male influence, the male father figure in the life of the Messiah. And it was purposeful and special that Joseph would play that role, despite the limited information that we might have about him in his life. Now, it's very interesting that Luke is the only author that gives us a snippet into the life of Jesus' adolescence, or his life even before the, uh, the baptism. He gives us this one story about Jesus when he's 12, and lots of sermons and lots of uh, 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 analysis 
an application can be made to this story. I just want to, in the context of, of how this relates to Joseph, just point out one little thing. So if you recall, they are, this is probably the first time, uh, Spirit of Prophecy says that this was the first time that Jesus had been brought at the Passover to um, Jerusalem. They felt that Jesus was ready. This was typical for a young man around the age of 12 to begin to fulfill the more uh, mature role within the family uh, and to observe these religious um, rites. So they go to Jerusalem. Somehow they get separated from Jesus. They are probably in a massive caravan. I mean, this is like, you know, think of camp meeting times 10, right? Uh, thousands of people, uh, kids are off doing their own thing. You're not always aware of where they're at. Uh, again, I want to be careful because uh, I don't think any party was necessarily at fault in this. I think it was mostly an accident. But Mary and Joseph, they take off in the caravan just assuming that Jesus is with all the kids, you know, uh, at, at the, uh, the second camel to the left or whatever the caravan looked like. They discover that he's not there. They panic. They rush back. They look for him. And this is where we pick up the story. Then after three days, they found him in the temple. He's in the temple sitting in the midst of the teachers, both listening to them and asking them questions. And all who heard him were amazed at his understanding and his answers. And I always like just to point this out in this story. You notice it says that they were listening, he was listening to them and asking them questions, but they were amazed at his answers and his understanding. And so you have this amazing interaction between Jesus and some of the teachers there at the temple Finally, Mary and Joseph come along. It says, when they saw him, they were astonished. And his mother said to him, son, why have you treated us this way? Behold, your father and I have been anxiously looking for you. Okay, very natural, right, mom? You know, your heart kind of goes out to Mary. And we realize that, I like that how some Bibles, they used to say when they would title this story, they would say, uh, Jesus lost in Jerusalem, right? But then Christian groups began to say, I don't like the idea that Jesus got lost. I don't think that's the idea. So they changed the title to things like the visit to Jerusalem or the search for Jesus, right? <laughs> okay, so you begin to see a transition in the relationship of Mary with and, and, and Joseph with Jesus. But Mary says to him, why have you treated us this way? Behold, your father and I have been anxiously looking for you, okay? And look what Jesus says. And he said to them, why is it that you were looking for me? Did you not know that I had to be in my father's house? And there's all kinds of ideas about why the Holy Spirit inspired this story. There's all kinds of ways that we can appreciate the story of Jesus being in the temple, Jesus growing in his maturity and beginning to understand his mission and, and how Mary and Joseph uh, were, were needing to appreciate uh, the, the role that they were to play. But you have this, and by the way, Luke is, Luke is very, I think he's intentional about this. You have this contrast. Your father and I have been looking for you. But I have another father. And I need to be about my father's business. Your father and my father. I think it's interesting that in desire, or um, actually this is from the youth instructor. It is not correct to say, as many writers have said, that Christ was like all children. He was not like all children. Many children are misguided and mismanaged. Not my children, but maybe some of yours are. But Joseph, but Joseph, and especially Mary, but she does say, but Joseph, and especially Mary, kept before them the remembrance of their child's divine fatherhood. Jesus was instructed in accordance with the sacred character of his mission. They kept before them the remembrance of their child's divine fatherhood. I think it's possible, if not likely, that that moment in Jerusalem was almost like a check to Mary and Joseph. This child has a grander purpose. And you as parents must nurture that. This child is not just like any other child. He has a divine lineage and parent, parentage, and you have the, the uh, opportunity and the responsibility to build into him 
that he is a child of God. He is a son of God. Now, don't divorce yourself from that too quickly. Say, well, that was nice for Jesus. He was that miracle uh, Savior, Messiah. There's a lesson for every parent in that idea. You too have the privilege of instructing your children that they also have a divine parentage, that they too are sons and daughters of God. Throughout his ministry, Jesus would refer to his Father in heaven dozens of times. He, he speaks all the time of, of the Father in heaven, always referring to his heavenly Father. Just a couple of quick ones. Luke chapter, I'm, I'm sticking in Luke for most of this. Be merciful just as your Father is merciful, speaking of the Father in heaven. I praise you, O Father, Lord of heaven and earth, that you've hidden these things from the wise and intelligent, but revealed them to infants. He's, he's speaking to his Father in heaven, in Luke 11. When you pray, he tells us all. When, when any of us pray, we are to pray, Father, hallowed be your name. We're to pray to our Father. Jesus has this clarity about who his Father is throughout his ministry, never seeming to really doubt that. At the most critical time in his life, Jesus would cry out to his Father three times. In the Garden of Gethsemane, Father, if you are willing, remove this cup from me, yet not my will but yours be done. We know that he prayed that three times. Father, let this cup be removed from me. On the cross, twice. of all, There's only seven sayings on the cross. Two of those sayings, Jesus would address his Father. Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they're doing. And then just before he dies, Jesus cried out with a loud voice saying, Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. Having said this, he breathed his last. He doesn't seem to have any doubt who his father is. Even at those critical moments. He also says, my God, my God, right? Why have you forsaken me? But he still acknowledges him as his God and his father. I think Jesus, Joseph gave Jesus many gifts. I think he was a good father. I think that he, he brought him up in the skills of carpentry. I think he, was, uh, he did provide a home and a devoted family. I think he was an example to Jesus of sincere belief. I think he loved Jesus. But I think the greatest thing that Joseph gave Jesus was that he made sure that he knew for certain who his father truly was. And I think that's the greatest gift we can give any of our children. So at the critical moments in their life, they have no doubt who their father is. Jesus said to them, peace be with you. As the father has sent me, I also send you. Would you pray with me? Our Lord and Savior, thank you that we can take a moment and look very briefly and very carefully still at some of the things we can learn from your growing up on this earth as a child. You give us a window, Lord. You give us a few areas that we can study and look at. And within that, we see different factors that helped you along the way. I think it's going to be very exciting to one day meet Joseph, to learn a little bit deeper about what that must have been like having him as a father. But Lord, I'm so glad that when the time came for you to be baptized, when the time came for you to live out the work as our Redeemer and Messiah, when the time came for you to be arrested and crucified, you knew exactly who your father was. And Lord, I thank you that your earthly father contributed to that assurance and to that reality. I pray that that would be all of our goals as parents today, that we could do a similar thing for our children, that we could raise them and encourage them and instruct them 
that there is a God in heaven that made them, and that there's a Father that loves them unconditionally, and that no matter what they're going through, they can always come to you, and you will be there for them, even if we cannot. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Lord bless you. I hope that you have a a wonderful Sabbath. uh, Next Sabbath will be Christmas Eve. We'll be having our service here. We hope that you can come. But there won't be other elements. We're not going to do a potluck that week. Uh, Probably, uh, you know, many people have other plans and there won't be other afternoon events. But we will be worshiping together. So if you can come, we look forward to seeing you then. Give me talking about Mary. I think it'll be a blessing. Happy Sabbath.